So Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm an American, so I tend to speak loud, but I also tend to speak quickly, so hopefully I'll get us through so we can have our nice dinner afterwards. <laughs> I am here to present a social science perspective on energy transitions, and that's broadly meant just to capture a bundle of different disciplinary approaches, history, a little bit of economics, sociology, innovation studies. There's even fields called transport studies or energy studies, climate policy, political science. So hopefully it'll be somewhat coherent. Um, I thought it's always good when you start to offer definitions. Aristotle said centuries ago that those who control the definition controls the debate. Uh, but as you may find unsurprising, the academic community cannot agree on even defining what a transition is. Uh, and I apologize for the small type for those in the back, but I'll, I'll speak through this a little bit. So what is a transition? <clears throat> uh, I think the classic definition is one that you would probably guess if you had to intuit it before uh, this you know, Brian level meeting happened, and that is it's a change in energy fuels, also known as security of supply, or SOS. Getting rid of biomass for electricity, from oil to gas, from nuclear, to solar, so it's changing the energy fuels or the socio-technical systems that provide those fuels. But while that definition is probably prominent in 90% of the literature, it's not the only way that you can view a transition. Uh, there's also changes in the technologies that use energy. Uh, and engineers sometimes call these prime movers. Uh, so internal combustion engines or gas turbines are examples, but so are microwaves, laptop computers, mobile phones, all the devices we just heard that need all these minerals uh, in order to function. And so here you can see fast transitions that have nothing to do with the source of energy, but they're in how we use energy itself, especially cars, air conditioners, um, and new digital devices. But yet, that's still only two dimensions. There's also changes in regulation. So the UK is known, especially Margaret Thatcher, for pushing in this notion of restructuring, privatization, and liberalization. And so you now have electricity markets and energy markets and gas markets around the world that have been either fully restructured or partially restructured. Um, you also have sometimes shocks to regulatory systems. The best example here would be Cuba, after the fall of the Soviet Union, had to fundamentally alter its energy market because it could no longer get subsidies from former Russia. And then you also have a whole family of people writing in what's called diffusion studies uh, that have all these diffusion models. The best one here is Everett Rogers, has what's called the diffusion of innovations theory. Uh, uses terms like early adopters, late adopters, laggards, pioneers, et cetera. And so that's simply talking about the delta. These types of studies will talk about the kind of time it takes for a new device to diffuse to a particular type uh, of market or consumer. And then finally, I haven't talking about the scale, so I think you can also have these transitions that occur in energy or devices or regulatory systems or diffusion curves um, at any level of analysis. Cities, good for London, uh, states, countries, regions, uh, and even regional blocks like OPEC <laughs> or the OECD or the European Union. In our work, we kind of tend to take a really easy approach that says all of the above. Uh, so you can study transitions on any of those different dimensions at any of those scales in, in meaningful ways. In terms of conceptualizing transitions, there are actually theories that exist. And here I'm happy to point not to my own work, but to Arnoff Grubler, who's at Vienna at IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. It's a mouthful. And Charlie Wilson, who is here at UEA. Uh, and they have this kind of really nice theory that is both spatial and temporal about transitions. The theory is spatial because, let's see if this works, it talks about going from the core of where an innovation happens, like the steam engine in England, then it kind of goes to the rim, Germany, France, the Netherlands, and then the periphery. And at this time, sorry, Portugal and Spain and Italy, they were the periphery. Although now I suppose you'd probably call them the core for a lot of European innovations. It's also a temporal thing because they talk about how you go through these different phases, experimentation, <laughs> kind of pre-commercialization, testing and piloting, then you go up to unit scaling, then industry scaling. This was a huge thing that for solar photovoltaics explained a lot of their reductions in cost, and then finally kind of market saturation, which doesn't always happen. I would argue that very few technologies reach saturation. Even mobile phones are showing growth. I think the best example here is the car. The conventional car has already peaked in terms of use or kilometers traveled in a lot of European countries. So that's probably one of the only things I can offer as a good example of something that has progressed through all of the different phases. Just to give you a kind of taste 
as much as I like Grubler and Wilson's theory, we did a project here where we actually spoke to the theoreticians, and we only spoke to 35. So this is a kind of qualitative, semi-structured Delphi approach where we ask the experts what they think about theories themselves. And these 35 experts, does anyone just want to guess? How many theories did they give us when we asked them? 35. What? <laughs> Go up. More than 70. Good. 35 is a good guess, because you would have thought that only my theory. Um, 96. Those 35 theorists, from a convenience sample, gave us 96 theories from a, from a rich mosaic of approaches. Psychology, behavioral science, STS, sociology, economics, poli-sci, public policy, and then the other, which is a catch-all for a whole other host of theories like communication studies, energy studies, ethics, linguistics, marketing, math, etc. And in the article, we offer the long list of theories, which I didn't bring with me. Um, uh, but it looks like this, where we actually number them 1 through 96, talk about the discipline, talk about what it's called, and they usually have these kind of clever acronyms, like the ABC theory. Um, we talk about who the key authors are, so you can look them up. And then we are, then finally provide kind of, well, what does it mean for this topic of transitions or what we call socio-technical change, right? the adoption of new technologies um, or the acceptance of new technologies. That's the long list of all 96. We then had a short list because the long list doesn't tell you which ones are like recurring, which ones are considered popular or, to use a better term, which ones have strong explanatory power or a strong fit. They're fit for purpose, to use the term. And there there were 14 theories that were mentioned more than 10% of the time. And that's a very arbitrary number, right? Why 10% and not 8% or 15%? Just because we wanted to make the article containable. Uh, and even discussing 14 theories is really tough. Um, and I'll just point out the top two. The most frequent, despite the diversity in the background of the theoreticians and that they were not talking about their own theories all the time, um, this kind of theory of socio-technical transitions, well, it sounds like it fits, right? If the question is transitions, it's also known as the multi-level perspective, sticking with acronyms, MLP. Uh, and this comes from history and sociology and evolutionary economics, and it talks about how niches, new and niche innovations have to battle against incumbent regimes, and they're influenced by exogenous factors called the landscape. I'll show you a diagram later. The other one, social practice theory, is the complete opposite. It doesn't focus on the technology, it focuses on the practices we have around the technology. Practices like cooking, bathing, sleeping, driving, courtship, etc. And I guess a good example here of kind of a practice-based approach, you would look at things like comfort, cleanliness and convenience, behind energy services. And a good example here, I have a Dutch colleague who confided in me the other day that 20 years ago he showered once a week. Because the norms back then, at least in the Netherlands, were you don't bathe every day. But now he showers twice a day. So there is a huge shift in practice that has a lot of related constituent components, energy, heat, soap, shampoo, right, <laughs> towels, laundry, that can probably meaningfully affect energy consumption in many ways. Uh, and he's showering magnitudes of order more now right, than he was in just a period of a few decades. So that's a kind of what a social practice theory would get you. Same with diet, what we eat, meat, organic diet, vegetarianism, veganism, et cetera. And there are others that you can just refer to the article to. In the article, we talk about all 14 of the theories, where they come from, what their components are, their strengths, as well as their weaknesses, which really got us into trouble with everyone we interviewed. But these theories all also have weaknesses. Um, moving aside from theory, since I realize a lot of you are hard-headed, practical, empirical people, especially the geologists and the physical scientists, um, what's the data say about transitions? And here, maybe also unsurprisingly, it speaks with a forked tongue. So there's a slew of evidence that talks about how long transitions are. So this comes up from a geographer who's well known in the field of energy studies called Vaclav Smil. Even his name sounds kind of pessimistic. Uh, and this is the same data, just plotted two ways. So up here is the timeline from 1750 to 2025, using projections from the International Energy Agency. And this is just, it's hard to add up the years, so this just replots them so you can see. And so if you talk about the scale of the globe, big energy transitions, capital B, you can see it takes a really long time. 
the transition to coal took 85 years to reach just 5% of total primary energy supply, and then another few decades to reach 25%, so it's from here to here. And that's despite the fact that coal had a lot of advantages over wood. It was dense, it was available, uh, created very new forms of power for steam engines, locomotives, factories, and all of that. Even the creation of, Ind of Indian Pale Ale, I hear, was connected to the beautiful steam engine. Um, and then oil, too, also took 80 years, despite all of its benefits. Liquid fuel in more than 150 countries, uh, use for internal combustion engines and all of that. Gas, even longer. Nuclear, despite the fact that Atoms for Peace was in the 50s, uh, is not even come close to a 25% share of energy, let alone 5%. And that is because I'm talking energy, not electricity. So we're talking the whole thing, not just a subcomponent of energy. And, of course, your renewables... Wind, solar, the only one that shows up is hydroelectricity. Everything else is below, I think, 1% of global energy supply, even though we've had solar photovoltaic <coughs> cells since the moon launch and windmills in the Netherlands for centuries. So it doesn't look good. And you get these nice quotes from Smil like this. Energy transitions have been and will be inherently prolonged affairs, especially in big countries that use lots of energy. India, China, the UK, France, the US. And here's where you may get into trouble. It is impossible to accelerate their progress, even if we were to resort to effective interventions. And here, I, I did already show you this, but I'm going to shift your focus now to the right column. This is the Grubler and Smill conceptual diagram that mentions the core and the rim and the periphery. Let's relook at the time phases. The phase in of coal in Europe. 160 years for England. The fastest transition was at the periphery, and so was 96 years. And, and if you take... The transition to the first item of the 50% for what? I think this threshold was tw uh, their threshold's 50%, which is different from Smills, which was 25. Good catch. And then you can see for the second one here, uh, a lot of double-digit numbers. The fastest one was 47 years for uh, Portugal. Right. So again, this, the data seems to support Smill's contention that even at the national scale, uh, these transitions take decades. It's an intergenerational challenge. Um, and Grubler has followed up with more recent data that talks about just more specific innovations. And he talks about the formative phases and the kind of diffusion phases. And the idea here is you have to add them together to get to the, the kind of true time it took to diffuse, because these are kind of Innovation, science, experimentation, and piloting, pre-commercialization. And this is once it's been commercialized, how long does it take uh, to reach different market segments? And you can see, again, other than, what is this, washing machines? No, I think that's fluidic, catalytic cracking, and CFLs and e-bikes. You can see, I mean, it's taking decades across each of the phases. And again, this is just for individual technologies. They warn, in this incredibly complicated figure, it's even longer for systems of systems, uh, with all of the caveats here in, in, in the footnote to the table, which I'm sure you can read tonight before you go to sleep. Um, but I, it just really emphasizes that it's, it's exponentially more difficult if you're talking about an entire system rather than just an individual piece of technology, which is intuitive, I think, to most of us. And then finally, I thought, I, I am in the UK. Let me find an example about England. The coal, the collapse of coal here. Even though that collapse arguably really started in the 50s with the Clean Air Act, and it was accelerated in the 80s with Thatcher and the kind of strike, the coal strike, uh, breaking it apart in markets, it still took this long for coal to decline in just this country, England, despite the fact that we've had all these alternatives, gas, nuclear, renewables, et cetera. And you can see here's in the 50s. It's this kind of, and you can see the punctuated equilibrium, right? It's up and down and up and down. It's not a very linear process. It's very disjointed and contested. Um, and you can see that even in 2000, you still had 50 million tons of coal happening here in modern England, um, although the numbers more recently come down a bit closer to zero. But this is a long time that has these different phases of destabilization uh, in, in very complex dynamic feedback loops. Okay, that was the, the, the downside. Is there a positive side? And I think there is, if, if you look hard enough for it. And what I show here is, if, if you don't take 
representative examples, and you look for just extreme examples. Can we find the fastest transitions that we just can, can look for? And you can. So we, we see here, and I'll, I'll speak about these because I know it's hard to see the text in, in the back. We took five transitions in those end-use devices, the prime movers, and that was energy-efficient lights in Sweden, cook stoves in China, also cook stoves with gas in Indonesia, flex fuel vehicles in Brazil. These are vehicles that can run on either petrol or ethanol. They can switch back and forth. Their engine can do both. We're not talking about blended fuel. They can run on pure ethanol or pure petroleum. Uh, and then, of course, air conditioning in the US, which may or may not be a good thing, but it is a device that diffused really quickly. And then we took five <clears throat> national supply, SOS, changes. Uh, and this was uh, oil and electricity in Kuwait, the Dutch dash for gas in the Netherlands, uh, nuclear in France, the French nuclear plan under Mesmer in 1973, uh, CHP, combined heat and power, district heat networks in Denmark. We could have chosen wind, but the CHP transition was even faster, three years. And then we chose the phase out of coal in Ontario, which is uh, one of the, the largest province by population in Canada. And what you can see here is it's not looking so bad. If you take the 25% number that SMIL gives you, I mean, only one of these transitions takes more than 16 years. The rest are all really quick with some, like flex fuel vehicles in Brazil, a year, uh, crude oil and electricity in Kuwait, two years, CHP in Denmark, three years, and Indonesian cook stoves program under the vice, pre the vice president, three years. And if you take all of the populations that were affected, by these transitions, which are also all recent. These are all in our lifetimes, right? Since the 70s to today, they affected 970 million people. Granted, a lot of that was in China um, and Indonesia. But still, I mean, the transitions in the US and the Netherlands and France, these aren't negligible. These are affecting millions of households and changing the dynamics of national systems that provide energy. You know, so the fact that almost a billion people have been affected in some way by some type of rapid transition gives some grounds, I think, for optimism and rethinking the historical record. And then my colleagues Florian and Carolyn are talking about how the fundamental dynamics behind transitions are changing. First and foremost, in the past, they tended to be by accident. We discovered a new resource or by crisis, OPEC, World War II. Whereas now, we, we can do it consciously, proactively. We can do it knowing what we're getting into with phased plans like feed-in tariffs and carbon taxes. They also talk about the kind of complex innovation ecosystems that can arise that very few people can predict. One would be the German feed-in tariff for solar, which was sold on the grounds of industrial strategy, actually helping the Chinese. I mean, Q-cells and other companies went bankrupt. Germany laid off 130,000 workers in their solar sector. China boomed. Now, while that isn't good for Germany, it's arguably good for the planet because the cost of solar photovoltaics dropped. Adoption has increased exponentially, right? So the, another exa example would have been shale gas in the US, which very few people predicted the kind of the cascading of innovations across seismic energy, imaging, horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing, et cetera. So these things are good because they can accelerate trends in ways that we didn't predict. And then finally, Florian and Carolyn had a lot of hope about the Paris Agreement. Um, I, I, I keep getting, I should check this, but I think only Syria and the US have not ratified it. That's pretty good. It's like, uh, that's, there are more than 180 political entities, if you count the Vatican and South Sudan and Kosovo and all that. So the fact that only two or so have not ratified it does signify a new level of perhaps political commitment behind climate change. And Florian have also done this policy brief that talks about you know, a new array of instruments we have that don't just phase in things, incentives. They disincentivize, have moratoriums, phase outs, taxes, et cetera. Bans of the automobile in Paris and London. Moratoriums on coal in Denmark and places like California. And then I thought to give you a bit more than just the academic perspective, I was lucky enough to attend one of these Junk meetings. And I'm sure you've never heard of Junk before, but it's this global intelligent network utility network coalition, which is run by IBM. And you probably have never heard of it, but you probably have heard of a lot of these companies. Eon, ERDF, Dong, although they've renamed themselves. Uh, Orsted, I think. TEPCO, we know TEPCO, right? Because of Fukushima. 
Um, but you know, Tata Power in India, CPFL at Centerpoint in the US, SGGE, San Diego, right? I mean, these are some major players. And I was shocked when I went to their forum, God, two years ago, time flies. And I was sitting there and they were giving presentations, this is from them, about how, how their business models are being predicated on not selling energy, on not providing kilowatt hours or gas. You had TEPCO stand up and literally say, we'll be a bank. We'll give you money, we'll give you bonds, we'll give you financing. And others stand up and talk about how, well, we're pretty good at sensors and data analytics, we can do that. Another utility was talking about alarms and safety, like ADT does here. So I mean, these utilities are talking about completely shifting their business models to the point where their energy isn't even their primary vehicle of supply. And they're already thinking about these business models now. This isn't an academic debate for them about what to do in 2020 or 2030. And anybody who's been following the business case for the big European utilities, RWE, Vattenfall, Eon, et cetera, they're in dire straits. They are not, I mean, they're border, bordering on bankruptcy. And I've seen some of the lowest market prices for their stocks, I think, ever. It's been called the utility death spiral by analysts who've tracked their kind of progress or lack of progress over the past decade. And I also found it shocking, this is from G. Young as well, that Two years ago in Houston, Texas, so this is from Centerpoint, there were 67 of these new innovations all about making the home smart. Not all of them relate to energy, but many do. Lighting, energy and utilities, so gas and heat. You don't need so much heat in Houston, Texas, but you do need a lot of air conditioning. And then you have other things that use a lot of energy, like home robots, right, et cetera. 67 of these, and I will remind you that the World Wide Web itself was about 1995, 1996? Anybody remember Netscape and all of that? I mean, who would have predicted in 1990 that we'd have this thing called the internet that would then connect with our smartphone and visualize energy and enable all these different services? So this also implies in just a period of a few decades, you can see unthought of innovations that at least relate to energy services. And then finally, I like this one because it's, uh, it's quite provocative. Citi, the bank, Citibank, had this kind of report a few years ago. Global oil demand, the end is nigh. Very academic. Um, but it was all about gas. It was all about how gas was substituting out for oil. And this is their global projection. It's basically a flat line. Once you account for gas and improvements in efficiency for conventional vehicles. And I was just admiring this ad for a new Jaguar a few days ago here in England that gets 90 miles a gallon. And that's a conventional car. That's not an EV, it's not a hybrid, right? So they're still innovating those things, materials, fuel efficiency, aerodynamics, uh, and all of that, and optimization of systems. And here you can see that it's not just transport. You also see pe petrochemicals, shipping, power generation, et cetera are all areas they expected gas to really grow. So what I like about this slide is it suggests that transitions can occur not because of changes in supply, but changes in demand, changes in preferences, substitutions of, of different fuels. All right, to conclude, because I think I've only got about five minutes left, what does this mean for you? The hard-headed physical scientists and others um, in, in the audience. I mean, I think first is the caveat Whenever you see stuff that talks about energy transitions, think about how are they defining it? Is it a technology? Is it a prime end use device? Uh, at what scale? And check the sources. You would be amazed at the number of mistakes that are made by journalists and also researchers that just get things wrong. They confuse CO2 with carbon. They confuse energy capacity with energy, so kilowatts with kilowatt hours, you know, et cetera. Also, as going back to my slide about the, the, the 14 theories or the 96 theories, we have no shortage of different concepts. Now, to some, this is perhaps a treasure chest to be mined. To others, it is a quagmire, a minefield to be avoided. And, and, and I'm torn on this because on the one hand, if there are 96 theories all trying to explain the same thing, does that imply that, that they're just all rubbish? Right? It's just scholars doing their thing in their ivory tower with different terms uh, that aren't commensurate with each other. Or instead, is this something to be celebrated because it reflects the diversity of the academy? Right? If there are 96 ways to view a painting, shouldn't there equally be 96 ways 
to think about a transition, each with their own benefits and their own novelty? Does it perhaps mean that, like I personally think, all of them are useful in certain ways with certain questions and methods, but that also means none of them give you a complete picture? So they're useful but wrong, paradoxically? And then finally, if you're simply looking at popularity, you could kind of do the frequency counts that we did. It does imply that the two theories that appear to be the most relevant right now, or as of last year, were the multi-level perspective on transitions and, and social practice theory. And again, I could see you going two ways with this. I could see you saying, that means I should use those theories because it's going to be easier and there's more literature to read. Or I can see you saying, I'm going to avoid those theories because everyone else is doing that. I'm going to do something new and use one of the other 96. I think thinking about policy, I told you I would come back to the multi-level perspective. And this is a graph about how it works with the niches and the regimes and the landscape. Um, however you take it, those 96 theories strongly imply we have to move beyond technology in our discussion, we have to move beyond markets, and even beyond policies. Because the true environment includes all three, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Behavioral practices, cultural norms, expectations, visions and discourses, just to name a few. And what I like about the graph, this is the simplified version, <laughs> for an article that we had in Science last year, um, it does imply the kind of evolutionary nature, the battle between the niches and the regimes, right? Many niches will die. And think through here of innovations that didn't make it, like the Betamax video player, or the natural gas turbine car, or I guess space colonies, which I'm still waiting for. Um, the other thing that implies is there are phases, and we call them phase one, phase two, phase three, but it's really like emergence, acceleration, stabilization, and decline. And then finally, I don't know what to do here, about this notion of temporality, that sometimes these transitions are about the right moment as well. I've seen some really good political economy discussion about Germany's feed-in tariff that suggests if it came a year too early or a year too late, it never would have happened. Why? Because their first feed-in tariff for solar was in 1990, which was exactly when the fall of the Berlin Wall was happening, and all the major incumbent German utilities were focused on how to electrify Eastern Germany. They were distracted and didn't even care about some miserly law about solar. And by the time it became really successful, it was too late for them to do anything about it. So that also implies this really tough kind of contextuality to transitions, that it's not just the right technology in the right place, but the right time. And it's very hard to predict that time looking forward. It's always easier to do it looking back. It also emphasizes that these transitions will remain multi-scalar processes, right? That whether it's niches and regimes and landscapes, or you want to use core, rim, and periphery, or local, national, global, whatever terminology you want to use, miso, meso, macro, that's what I mean when I'm talking about the complexity of these processes. That also suggests that we have to get a lot better if we are going to try to craft policy at capturing that complexity. And this is a recent article. I'm pretty sure most of you don't read Nature Climate Change, so it came out a few months ago. This is the author team who's helping the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, with the next assessment, uh, including a few people at Oxford and Manchester, so there's some good English scientists involved. And what I like about it, this is just one way of thinking about policy. It's no longer as simple as we need a carbon tax or we need cap and trade. Notice. They've called this the avoid, shift, improve framework. So I like that it's showing a bundle of different policies. There's more than 40 here, by the way, that are doing very different things synergistically. Some are actually avoiding right things we don't want, like resource and efficiency or materials that expire. Some are talking about changes in practices, less air conditioning, using a fan, taking colder showers, air drying your laundry, eating less meat. And others are talking about what we continue to kind of be more familiar with, which is innovation, RD&D, better batteries, better solar efficiency, better heat systems, et cetera. And what's needed is all of those, and it's not just energy. It's also transport, products and services, food, et cetera. Right? So again, we're moving beyond policies to policy mixes. And then lastly, this is my last slide. Um, Going back to the 10 transitions that I talked about, the five national supply and the five end use devices, let's not forget that those causes behind them are, as that window of opportunity dialogue helps underscore, very difficult to predict. World War II, 
really influenced the French and Kuwaiti transitions. Uh, the French wanted to be radiant after German occupation, so Charles de Gaulle embarked on the nuclear program, both for security but as well as image and prestige. It was the end of World War II that freed up conflict zones in the Middle East so that Kuwait could peacefully explore its oil resources. Oh, there was a rural famine behind the cookstoves program in China. People were eating bark and stones. Um, the oil crises had a really lasting mark on the policies in Denmark and Brazil, the pro-alcohol program, which was a precursor to the flex fuel vehicle program. Only one of them seems to be kind of demand-driven, as in it wasn't a policy and it wasn't an external shock. And that's air conditioning. And that's perhaps the only one we can't really say it was necessarily sustainable right, in, in a good way. And I think, well, history is useful to examine, future transitions could turn all of these causes upside down, right? Future transitions could be driven not by supply and not by abundance, but by scarcity, by phase-outs, and by very different selection pressures in our demand for energy services. And so I think if you also want a simplified conclusion, Smill and Grubler and Wilson are right. Past transitions have taken a long time, but the past doesn't have to be prologue. And while history can be instructive, it does not always have to be predictive. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> so, because you're a social scientist, I'm going to introduce you at the end of your talk. <laughs> but uh, Ben is professor of energy policy at the University of Sussex, right? That's right. Are you from Canada? U.S. U.S., okay. Whereabouts in the U.S.? The Midwest. Okay. Ohio. Okay, Ohio, right. If the country were a person... Ohio would be its heart. Okay. <laughs> That's true. I love it. Anyway, I, I think you've, you've really helped us broaden our, our very sort of technical debate on energy uh, to bring in the social dimension, which is why we invited you here. So we are at the end of our day, but I think we, we'd like to have five or ten minutes for questions and then a bit of a wrap-up. So please, questions for Ben on the uh, energy policy issues. Uh, there's one here already. He went first the last time. I know. Raise your hand, anyone else? So, Ben, you, you, you know, you're a professor of energy policy, and you're phrasing this as energy, but surely it's about CO2 emissions, and I thought you were getting most on track when you showed us the, the slide at the end when people were looking at a lot of different things to try and cut CO2 emissions. So, so do you think you're just using the tools that you've got to hand and that, you know, is, is, is your frame of reference to look at this, whereas actually... I think, as far as the climate cares, it's just greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. It doesn't really care about energy. Well, I think, I mean... So it's not an energy, it's not an energy transition. It's a, it's a greenhouse gas going into the atmosphere transition. Yes, this was, a, this was not low-carbon transitions. This was very much energy transitions. But I, I think it's a mistake to reduce it all to carbon. And we have a whole other research stream that looks at energy justice and all of the ethical and moral issues. And also some qualitative work. Right, but, but society does, and politicians do, and people do. But that's the type of, but that's the type of technocratic approach that has made climate policy so intractable, and politically unfeasible. John, I think you've had your say. There's more to say on that. Okay, over here. No, that's, that's a great question. I, I wish I could answer it um, because it implies, I mean, I've given you 10 transitions, but if we're talking like overall, what's the track record? If we've had, you know, 1,512 documented transitions, how many have been fast and slow? I mean, without having any data, my guess would be most have been slow. The failures far outnumber the successes, and so I think the record is probably pessimistic, which is why you see at the grand global scale of total primary energy supply, or total final energy consumption, which are very similar, the two are linked. Uh, those numbers about it taking 100 plus years for oil, gas, and nuclear, right, to kind of go through the system. That said, there is a lot of room for optimism. So there's a report out there that comes out every year called, they need to rename it, REN21, Renewable Energy Network 
for the 21st century called the Global Status Report. And they have a whole section on policy. And if you look through the appendices, you know, hundreds of countries have pretty aggressive, at least on paper, plans for renewables or carbon or efficiency or transport fuels, et cetera. I mean, it's something like 80 countries have a feed-in tariff. Um, so there's at least a little bit of optimism there. I think the reason that you're not seeing those catalyzed into transitions is it does take time, right? Even the German transition, if you started in 1990 or 2000, that's still 20 years ago. And what was German renewable energy at in terms of energy? It's still, what, is it 20% if About that? 20, yeah. yeah. So I mean, even then, uh, and if you look at the projections for the Nordic countries looking to 2050, they won't be carbon free for at least another 15 or 20 years. Um, so I guess the problem with all of those policy mixes is they have to swim upstream against an existing policy architecture that has favored fossil fuels and nuclear for, for centuries. I mean, something like 80% of subsidies in the OECD countries have gone to nuclear, coal, or fossil, or gas, you know, even up till like last year, yeah. so. Let's take two more points, so yeah. Yeah, um, so not in that paper, but we, we have a book with MIT Press that has eight other cases, two of which are the same, Denmark and Germany. Uh, and there we do talk about kind of common ingredients across the transitions, and, and for, it's going to oversimplify things a bit, but essentially the first one was they all had champions, so whether it was an individual or an institution uh, or a political party that really got behind it. Uh, very strongly, very visibly. The second was they were all polycentric in terms of involving numerous stakeholders. And here it was like not just government, and not just government and private sector, but also civil society, faith-based groups, social and consumer advocacy groups, communities themselves, et cetera. So it was a blending of scales and responsibilities that created a kind of governance safety net that improved transparency and feedback, but it also meant that if one of those actors was shirking their duties, other actors kind of stepped in. And the final one, kind of similar to, I guess I can't go back, similar to the policy mixes stuff that kind of avoid, shift, improve. In all of those transitions, we, we did see very a, a multitude of policies. It wasn't just a handful. You had policy environments that were both um, consistent over time, very few changes, uh, and involved, I would say, at least 10 plus instruments in a different sequence. Um, tended to be the same sequence too, like carbon taxes and then feed-in tariffs and then efficiency improvements, et cetera. So there's a very rough answer. We've got two, two more questions and we'll uh, conclude. Mine was very similar to the last question asked, so I'd just be duplicating. Okay, very good. Back there. Peter Dolan with ERC Equipoise. Um, I'd like to go to your temporal uh, dimension. It seems to me that debate today, be it at the personal level, on the internet, or even between superpowers, is becoming more and more No, and this, this fits into the first question, you know, which is about personally, I'm actually, climate comes before all else. This is one planet. If we get it wrong, we're done. But I think I've come to be a lot more nuanced in, in how that is discussed and framed. And on the downside, it implies that the frame we've been using, this kind of science says we cannot exceed these certain planetary limits, listen, isn't working anymore, whether it's because people can say it's fake news or it's post-truth regime or the more kind of political thing. I mean, Lord Stern... I once heard give a lecture that talked about how he was surprised there was so much political will for climate change because it's entailing political costs in the present for gains in the future. And that's a sacrifice very few leaders will want to make. Um, that said, the fact that energy also cuts across all these different dimensions, jobs, security, health, futurity, insurance, diseases, et cetera, means that we could also capture and reframe climate. So that it isn't just a scientist in a white lab coat. It's a grandmother talking about what she's thinking about her grandchildren. It's a general talking about security. It's a medical doctor talking about disease epidemics. You know, it's, it's a philosopher talking about justice. And so we can, it's not just about climate. It is also about efficiency, cost, health, equity, and our future. 
And I think that might be where the kind of scientific discourse needs completely redone. And maybe that means that we turn this weakness of having such a fragmentation of frames and views into a strength, because it means climate, you, you can have so many frames that explain it, because it touches on all these different aspects, that it becomes a rhetorical strength. Well, I think we should wrap up the discussion. That was really stimulating. So thanks thank again. You. to uh,